Okay, welcome back to our CNT 140 class. This week we'll be covering chapter 15, testing and certifying the land wiring. The objectives, the objectives that we're going to be highlighting will be certifying cable and connecting hardware, scanner performance, cable plan certification, testing methods, and analog versus digital testers. So let's get started. The testing of installed cable is a critical part of the process of creating a successful structured cabling system. The major, region, major reason is to specify a standards-based land wiring scheme, it is to ensure that your installed cable will meet the needed level of performance for your intended use. There are three basic requirements for providing a cabling system that will meet the TIA uh, 568C performance standards. First, you must design a structured cabling plan that will meet the desired performance criteria when the other two requirements are met. Second, you must use cable and connecting components that are certified at a proper level of performance. And third, you must employ proper insulation methods so that the performance potentials of the cabling and components are achieved. Now this is a long way of saying that a well-designed land wiring system using the proper cable and connectors and installed with a good workmanship will operate at the expected level of performance. Previous chapters in this book have described all of these key concepts individually. In this chapter, we'll explore the uh, uh, ways in which you can verify the proper operation of your installed cable system. We'll discuss some of the ways in which cable and components are certified to a particular level of performance by their manufacturers. In addition, we'll see how uh, you can perform inspection and testing to ensure that your installed cable plant meets the required performance levels. Next, we'll talk about the test equipment and you will need to verify that you're going to need to verify your installation. And then finally, we'll show you how to use that test equipment to do cable performance testing and then link certification. Certifying cable and connecting hardware. The primary standard for land performance certification in the United States and many other countries is the TIA 568. The full name of the latest version of the standard is uh, TIA 658C, Commercial Building Telecommunications Wiring Standard. Several other standard bodies, including the Canadian Standards Association and the ISO, have similar or coordinated standards, such as the CSA, the CSA uh, T529, and the ISO IEC. Uh, as cabling performance levels have increased, the TIA realized that additional information and guidelines were necessary to ensure a properly functioning cable link. It was important to identify those factors that allow an installed cable link to meet the desired cable of performance, and likewise, testing techniques were needed to certify the performance levels of individual cabling components, such as connecting hardware and even the patch ports. The TIA has continually issued documents called Telecommunications System Bulletins, or TSBs, to provide supplementary information and procedures. The TSBs have provided the critical testing methods and standards to cover the performance testings of your installed cables. A very key early supplement, the TSB 67 back in 1995, uh, the transmission uh, performance specifications for field testing of unshielded twisted pair cabling systems, provided the basic standards for the testing of installed links. Another supplement, the TSB 95, Additional Transmission Performance Guidelines for 100 Ohm 4 pair CAT5 cabling gave added standards for testing the installed CAT5 cable to determine if it could meet or successfully handle the gigabit operations. The TSB 155 provided a similar testing standard to verify the 10 gigabit uh, Ethernet operation to 55 meters over existing CAT6 cabling. A number of addenda have been approved for each section of the base uh, 568 standard, which function essentially as amendments to the standard. And eventually, the provisions of all these supplements and addenda are incorporated into the uh, subsequent full letter revision of the standard, and the process then starts all over again. The 568C standard contains information regarding the performance levels of connecting hardware and cable used for telecommunications wiring. And this standard contains explicit testing methods for some items and refers to documents from other organizations such as the, uh, the ASTM uh, D-4566 uh, for other items. Cable and connecting hardware manufacturers offer components that are said to provide a certain level of performance as delineated by the standard. 
the general measure of component performance uh, is the category of operation. CAT 3, 5E, 6, and the AC6 are defined in the standard and as supplements, along with their corresponding recommended uses. CAT 7 is forward-looking and is being defined in other documents, but will be incorporated into the base standard eventually. Let's please refer to Part 2 for an explanation of the categories and then how they affect your choice of cable and connecting components. The parameters that are specified in the 568C pertain to the performance of those components prior to their installation and the performance testing of installed links, in addition to the base standard sections. Each section includes built-in supplementary information uh, in form of annexes. An annex may be informational or mandatory. Uh, the annexes are an important part of the standard because they contain test uh, setups, methods for verifying performance, and information on the legacy cabling. For example, the requirements for additional testing of legacy CAT5 cabling for gigabit operations. Now, originally in the, in the TSB95, uh, it is now an annex to the 568C.2. The actual testing of individual cabling components is the responsibility of the manufacturer of the item. Manufacturers may do their own testing to certify conformance with the standard, or they may use an outside testing facility. In some cases, manufacturers also have a recognized independent testing laboratory, such as the UL verify that the testing was performed properly. Some independent labs also offer a continuing verification of, or certification program so that the manufacturers may further assure their prospective customers that their products meet the necessary performance criteria. As the cabling installer, you are responsible for using only components of a proper category, installing them properly, and for field testing of the installed cable uh, cable links to verify the proper operation of the rated categories. If you're an IT manager, this process may be done by you, your installation contractor, or an independent third party to certify compliance at the rated category. If you expect to provide a land wiring system with a particular level of performance, you must use only components and cable that have been certified for that category of operation or higher. Uh, for example, uh, for a CAT3 installation, you may use CAT3, 5E, or 6 uh, components, but you must use only CAT5E or higher cable and connecting hardware for a CAT5E system. A common misconception is that CAT6 cable is always better than using CAT5E cable for an application that requires only CAT5E operation, such as 100 base T. However, if you use components and installation techniques that are only appropriate for CAT3, you essentially get only that level of performance. The performance of cabling uh, system is only as good as its weakest link, and a category of performance is equal to the lowest certification and installation workmanship of any component. You could well argue that a higher category of cable will ensure meeting a lower category of performance. The higher grade cable may improve performance margins a bit, but the only gain to you is in those instances when the lower category of cable might reveal other marginal conditions such as interfering uh, uh, electrical fields or longer than permitted cable on a uh, longer permitted cable runs. A much better better reason for using a higher cat uh, component is that you could at later time upgrade the cat 5v6 without repulling any wire. Be cautious, though, as this potential for later upgrade might be wasted if other CAT 5B or 6 installation practices are not followed. <clears throat> performance levels. What does component certification really mean? Because recognized performance categories exist, uh, a cable or connector that is marketed as meeting the requirements of a certain category should be tested to verify that, that, that claim. Now, because the manufacturers are responsible for testing these components themselves, they often provide typical test results in the literature. Some manufacturers will provide detailed test reports upon request and offer product guarantees to back their claims. Now, in addition, independent laboratories offer manufacturer verification testing programs that range from a one-time test report to a continuing test program with random testing. Now, obviously, you're more insured 
of uh, quality components with a continuing verification program than with a single test sample. The 568C outlines the performance specifications and very detailed test procedures that must be followed to certify components to a particular category. Pluggable connector components uh, present some unusual challenges in reliability testing uh, as they must be checked for connectivity degradation. Random samples uh, of each component are tested for degradation of contact resistance and installation resistance and tests for durability, vibration, stress, relaxation, thermal shock, and humidity temperature cycle. This testing is to be done by the manufacturer to certify its parts to a recognized performance category. A cautious manufacturer might choose to have the certification verified by an independent testing laboratory because of uh, a lot rise on the higher categories of operation. Now surprisingly, with regard to connector plugs and jacks, the 568C standard calls for only uh, 200 insertion slash withdrawal cycles without failure, usually defined by excessive contact resistance. Some manufacturers may specify a usable life of 500 to 2,000 cycles for their connectors, although the standard only calls for 200. The point is made that these components have a finite life. Modular connectors that are used in patch panels with frequent use may be expected to exceed the standard uh, parameter over normal equipment life. Moreover, connectors that are used in test equipment, such as uh, for cable certification, can't exceed that number of cycles in a single afternoon. The user is only cautioned by the standards to inspect the connectors for signs of wear. It would be much safer either to use connectors designed for high use uh, or to periodically replace the connectors on high use equipment. You would also be wise to keep a usage log of your test cables and replace them regularly as the modular plugs used on these cables have the worst degradation from multiple insertions. Connectors must also be tested for transmission performance, attenuation, and near-end crosstalk. Barring the degradation from excessive use, modular connectors have an innate contact resistance that is not significant when compared to the bulk resistance of a length of cable. The wire pins that form the connector are typically gold-plated to minimize this contact resistance. However, the modular type connectors using the current wiring standards do exhibit a significant amount of cross-coupling that appears as near-end crosstalk. All the 8-pin modular stock connectors are bad in this respect, but testing is done to make sure the near-end crosstalk is not worse than allowed. The table behind me shows the attenuation and near-end crosstalk performance parameter limits for CAT3, 5E, and 6 components. CAT5 is no longer sanctioned, but it had about a 3 dB worth performance at 100 MHz. You can see from the values that little contribution to circuit loss is expected from the circuit hardware as most comes from contact resistance. For comparison, the DC insertion uh, resistance is only about 0.3 ohms for a connector compared to 9.2 ohms per 100 meters for the cable. However, the near-end crosstalk contribution from the connectors can be significant. So, for example, 100 megahertz, at 100 megahertz, the next near and crosstalk uh, loss of the connecting hardware must be better than 43 dB, while the cable alone must be better than 32.3 dB for 100 meter length. The entire terminated and installed permanent link allows only an additional 3 dB to a 29.3 dB at 100 megahertz over the raw cable for all the uh, intervening connecting hardware and insulation anomalies. This is an area, by the way, where a higher enhanced grade cable may increase the margin of performance for a link. However, the connectors cannot be much improved and remain compatible with the standard modular design. The low near and crosstalk requirements of CAT 5 v and 6 are one of the primary reasons that the traditional screw type uh, wire terminals are no longer acceptable in those applications. You can easily observe the increased near and crosstalk of screw, uh, screw terminal jacks with any of the more sophisticated cable scanners.
You might think of the near and crosstalk loss number as the amount of isolation from an interfering signal. Connector assemblies that are designed for the higher categories normally use an integrated printed circuit board and uh, uh, with carefully routed wiring to minimize near and crosstalk. Screw terminals are also uh, technically rejected on grounds of pair untwist, which must remain below uh, 0.5 uh, inches, which is a half an inch for categories uh, 5e and 6. The station cable must often be untwisted in excess of those limits to reach the screw terminals. Screw terminal connectors also have unacceptable length of untwisted wire between the screw terminal and the actual connector body. Now these factors lead to the unacceptable level of near and crosstalk and impedance anomaly in screw type jacks. You should be aware that there are some insulation displacement connectors uh, that use similar space wiring between the IDC block and the modular connectors. Both the 110 and 66 type mini blocks may be found in these types of outlet plates. These connector assemblies do not meet the needs for CAT 5 e 6 and should be avoided. This problem comes not from the connecting blocks but from the internal outlet wiring from the jack to the block. Do not confuse these jack plates with the acceptable style that integrates the 110 block into the connector as part of the printed wiring assembly. Cable used in horizontal and backbone uh, runs must also meet performance standards. The table behind me shows the attenuation near and crosstalk performance parameters for CAT3, 5B, and 6 cable. And note that these levels are for the raw cable, not an installed link. Horizontal cable must meet essentially the same requirements uh, as backbone cable. The attenuation near and cross off limits are calculated from a formula in the actual standard and the values in the table merely illustrate the calculation of a, speci of a specific discrete frequencies. Cable attenuation is known to vary with ambient temperature. The cable must also be tested by the manufacturer to meet adjusted loss limits at 40 and 60 degrees Celsius. The maximum allowable attenuation at these elevated temperatures for CAT 5e and 6 is adjusted by a factor of 0.4% uh, increase per degree of Celsius. Cable must also meet other transmission related specifications of DC resistance and unbalanced mutual capacitance, capacitance unbalanced to, gr to ground, characteristic impedance, and structural return loss. The resistance and capacitance components are primarily a function of the characteristics of the copper wire and the insulation material. These values are consistent and are easily described by a single set of values for each category. Now as the table shows behind me, uh, characteristic impedance is specified as 100 ohm plus or minus 15%. However, it turns out that it is rather difficult to make a consistent measurement of characteristic impedance of twisted pair wire because of the variations of the cable structure over its measured length. Consequently, the characteristic impedance value is derived by smoothing the results of the measurement of a, of a parameter called structural return loss or stru yeah, structural return loss. Now the, the SRL or structural return loss may uh, vary rather wildly from 1 MHz to the highest reference frequency of 1600 or 250 MHz for CAT, 5, uh, CAT 3, 5B, or 6. Now for this reason, there's an absolute minimum limit for the SRL, and it's imposed for each category. Now when the SRL value is higher than the limit, it indicates that the impedance variation is better than required for the cable pair. The limit applies to the worst pair of cable, so all pairs must be tested. Now because the twist pitch or lay length of different pairs is varied to decrease to decrease near and crosstalk, each pair of a cable will show a variation in values of most of the measurement parameters. Some of the standard limits are based on the worst pair's value, while others, such as attenuation, require all the pairs to be at, uh, at least as good as the limit value. This intentional difference is capable is cable geometry and cable geometry also contributes to some of the variations that we see in the SRL. Patch cords and cross neck jumper wires 
must meet the requirements of horizontal cable with some exceptions. It is assumed that the patch cords will use stranded wire for increased flexibility. Stranded wire pairs are expected to have slightly greater attenuation than solid copper, so an increase of 20% in attenuation is allowed over that for horizontal cable. The attenuation value is uh, prorated for length, since patch cords are generally far shorter than horizontal cable runs. Now, these wires need not be tested at elevated temperatures. In addition, uh, the stranded wires must have a twist pitch of 15 millimeters uh, or 0.6 uh, inches or less. The standard specifies a clear system of category marking for cable and connecting hardware. The category should be marked either in the words category and where it ends the number of the category 5e, 5, 6, whatever, or with a letter, a large letter C with the cat number uh, in the center. Now these markings as shown here behind me, okay, now the category of, of some wire components can be very difficult to determine once they are installed. A sticker on the plastic bag, a uh, label on the package, or a note in the data sheet is not, mu not of much use. So the standard requires marking and it should be easy for manufacturers to stamp, emboss, or label each jack plug or cable with the rated category number. After all, you're paying extra for the performance. The best rule is if it doesn't say CAT 5E or whatever, don't assume it's a CAT 5E. Try to use marked components whenever possible. So let's look at pitfalls and specsmanship. Okay. The greatest danger in evaluating cable and connector hardware specifications is that the certifications may not be based on the most current standards. The category nomenclature has evolved over a period of years for a loose general specification to a very specific and uh, uh, tough measured parameter specification. Now originally the progressive ratings of performance were called levels 1 through 5 and over time the term category was introduced and eventually adopted by several standard bodies including the TIA, TIA, United Laboratories and the ISO slash IEC which have a corresponding class uh, A-F system for links. Now, now the performance parameters and testing methods have been further tightened although the existing category terminology still remains. Participation in a continuous testing verification program by one of the major independent labs is the best assurance that the latest standards are being used. You may have cable or connectors on hand that do not strictly meet the current performance requirements of the categories. It is possible also that the testing was done with outdated procedures. You would be confident that the latest performance standards were met only if your hardware and cable were certified to meet the 568C. Uh, a reference to the 568A would probably suffice since it was a revision to the original uh, 568. And in some cases, previously manufactured components may reference the technical bulletins that were uh, issued uh, prior to being incorporated. Now for the most part, uh, into the 568-C. Now test equipment that meets the TSB uh, 67 requirements uh, should be fine for CAT 5, but you may need to update or replace your test equipment to test for the, uh, the service bolt in 95. The CAT 5B or CAT 6 uh, was outlined in the uh, TSB 95. Now, one pitfall you should avoid is the use of components that diverge from the recognized standards. For example, other styles of uh, plugs and jacks may have much better uh, near and crosstop performance than the ubiquitous 8-pin modular hardware. Typically, these other connectors in the hardware are presented as having an advantage over the standard product. Uh, this is that you see a way to say standard so that it may, it seems ordinary. However, wiring standards are not only a set of performance parameters uh, and installation practices, but a standard uh, style of interface to the user equipment. That allows multi-vendor interoperability with a high level of performance. 
Now, any item that does not comply with the standards is an exception um, that may be a potential problem on your network. Now, this is, you see, also a way to hear exceptional that says it's not compliant. And for the time being, you may be taking a risk if you choose to use some of these better but non-standard connectivity options. So, earlier I said specmanship. What the heck is specmanship? Well, specmanship is a term for the exaggeration or misleading presentation of product specifications that sometimes occurs in the marketplace. Now, fortunately, the existence of recognized national and international standards uh, minimizes the occurrence of specmanship, but it still occurs. Uh, were there no standards, you can be sure that various manufacturers would make conflicting product claims that would be impossible for the buyer to resolve. The tough standards for telecommunications cabling make product differences clear, clear, clearly recognizable, unlike my speech right there. Uh, all you have to do uh, is know which standard of performance you want the product to meet, and then be sure that the products you use meet that standard. Now, there is a continuing controversy that involves connector performance. The controversy concerns the relatively high nearing crosstalk of all modular connectors and the measurable differences in longitudinal balance of some connector jack designs. Now, several types of non-modular connectors are available that have significantly lower levels of near and crosstalk than the popular 8-pin modular design. Now, some of these connectors are used for field test instruments to reduce the contribution to near and crosstalk from the test set and are quite acceptable for testing the permanent link. However, a compatible lower near and crosstalk modular connector style will be much more desirable than attempting to replace uh, more than a decade of installed uh, modular connectors with other connectors. Several manufacturers are working on the improved products and we are already starting to see clever plug and jack designs emerge from the issues of longitudinal balance and resonance phenomena that are more subtle. Resonance phenomena can cause short lengths, particularly under 15 meters to exceed the allowable near and crosstalk performance and is related to the return loss and or balance of the link. So let's look at the cable plan certification. Now in addition to using uh, properly rated cable and components in your land wiring installation, you should plan to test your installed wiring system to the expected level of performance. Now installing a cable plan or wiring system is a complex task particularly if you intend for it to support high performance 100 or gigabit networks. Even the 10 meg Ethernet and 16 meg token ring had to have station cables that met a certain level of performance to have been considered reliable. Now, most LAN wiring is put to use immediately after cable plan installation. Initial uh, operation of the workstation is a good indication that the cable is all right, but it's not positive proof that the cable is in perfect condition, particularly if your workstations are still using 10 or 16 meg technology and you plan to go to higher speeds. Also, it's not unusual for some of the station drops to remain unused until some later date. How will you know if these drops will, will work when you need them? Well, would you have a light fixture installed and not try the switch? Well, probably not. You need to test each drop of your cabling system as well. The best way to test cable is to use proper test equipment that looks only at the cable performance. In that way, you avoid the nagging little network problems that obscure the real issues. Cable often gets blamed for problems that are really network hardware problems and bad software configurations. Best time to do the testing is before the furnishings and people have been moved in. At this point, all outlet jacks are accessible without the need to move desks and other furniture. Any inspections and repairs that are needed can be done quickly and without disturbing anyone. And of course, modular furniture will have to be in place because the cable must be installed in the, mo in the furniture modules before it can be tested. Now, the TIA has offered a service bulletin dash 72, now incorporated into the 5CAC as a means to provide an intermediate point 
for interconnections to modular furniture. We can go back to chapter 10 of the open office wiring to, to get more information on that if you choose. Now, let's look at testing the installed cable. Now, the testing of installed cable links is often referred to as certification. Uh, certification is normally prefer, performed by the installer and involves testing each individual cable link to a recognized standard. The end result of the certification is a report that shows the actual measurements of each cable link and the pass or fail determination. A, a dilemma initially existed in providing a method of testing and certifying installed telecommunications cables. The original 568 standard specifically stated that the performance standards for cable and connecting hardware did not apply to installed systems. The reason for this was that it was known that an installed cable run had performance um, that was below that of cable tests in the factory. As a matter of fact, a correlation problem seemed to exist between cable tested with a factory RF network analyzer and with the field test instruments. Now, whether the field testers gave actual measurements of the parameters or judged the cable on pass fail criteria, uh, there were differences that might cause factory certified cable to fail a field test. Some of the differences were to be ex expected as the installed cable had several wire terminations, cross connects, and modular connections that did not exist in the factory. Also, the standard factory test was and is to lay the cable out on a non-conducting surface such as a concrete floor or loosely coiled and use a specified or a special test adapter to connect to a network analyzer. Cable in the walls is bent, pulled, tie wrapped, run along metal pipes, steel beams, placed in conduit and installed in all manner of non-ideal conditions that uh, affect its performance. You would expect it to perform differently. Moreover, there were no standards for accuracy for field testers that, were, that their performance varied considerably. And no wonder there was no correlation. Fortunately, the situation is much improved with the newer standards such as the 568B and C. The performance of installed cable is specified in detail as is the accuracy of the field testers. Even the required tests, testing methods, and the methods of reporting the results are specified. The correlation of field tester performance with laboratory network analyzers is also made. All of this lends a wonderful consistency and reproducibility of the testing of installed cabling that gives a real confidence factor to a cable plant certification. Certification for installed cables may be done two standard ways, permanent link testing and channel testing. Now, both of these testing methods are defined in 568C, which builds on the worst case link model. The permanent link covers the horizontal cable from the workstation outlet at one end and, the, and to the initial point of the termination at a cross neck block or a patch panel in the telecommunications room, excluding the test cords and the test equipment, and of course, excluding any user cords. Now, this is the portion of the horizontal cabling system that is permanently installed by the wiring contractor. It forms the essential litmus test of a proper structured wiring installation job and includes all the effects of component quality and workmanship. The test connection of the telecommunications room termination is a horizontal run that may require special adapters unless the termination is directly into a modular patch panel. For example, the test cord would have to terminate in a 110 adapter plug if that type of connecting block were used. Originally, the TIA documents identified the permanent link as the basic link, but terminology uh, parallel to that of the uh, ISO slash IEC have been substituted uh, in new revision to the 568 standard. Uh, you can go all the way back to chapter one and, and look at the figure uh, 1.9 uh, for a graphic of that. Now the channel includes the actual equipment cords, uh, user cords, patch cords, and cross neck wire that connect to the network or telephone uh, equipment at each end. Now keep in mind that the word actual means just that. Once you certify a channel with a particular set of equipment cables, those cables are now frozen in place as far as the standards channel testing method is concerned.
Now, if you change cables to use a longer or shorter cable, for example, you would then have to recertify the channel. The permanent link was designed to allow a cable installation to be certified once the horizontal cables were installed by the installation contractor. As a matter of fact, the link was originally called the contractor's link. Now, naturally, the user and patch cords were not in place at this stage and would have been impossible to test. Nevertheless, the performance of the entire link, the channel, is ultimately what the user depends on. So, this test was also included as an important benchmark of overall performance. So, which link test should you use? Well, permanent link certification is probably sufficient in most cases of new installations. It will ensure the 90 meter maximum of horizontal cable is performing to specifications. The permanent link test is considered the most reasonable performance testing standard for a turnkey cable system installation because the vendor may have little or no control over the cables used to connect to the equipment. Also, the build-out stage of construction is the best time to correct any problems that are revealed by a permanent link test. After the network equipment is installed and connected, it will be easiest and most useful to do channel testing. The channel test is obviously very useful in dealing with network equipment vendors. You can rely on your cable system completely when it's been certified as a channel, uh, as a channel. Uh, performance levels. Two types of performance levels should be considered in making field tests. First being the performance category of the cable system. You should determine along, uh, long before the installation what category of performance you require and then test to that level. The second type of performance is the accuracy level of the field tester that you intend to use to certify that cable. Uh, we've discussed the cable performance categories at length in other chapters. The three categories of operations specified in the 5CHC and related standards are 3, 5E, and 6. A new tighter version of category 6, called AC6, or augmented CAT6, uh, is tested to 500 megahertz or better. Other standards, such as uh, some of the ISO documents, categorize some similar performance levels, although with some differences. Uh, for example, the ISO uh, uh, speci may specify identical categories for uninstalled cable and components, but uses a class system for installed links. The table here behind me shows how the TIA categories correspond to the ISO classes. And in most instances, the TIA categories are the same or tougher in test parameters and may be substituted with no problem. If you are in a situation that needs to reference these other standards, you should adjust your testing accordingly. While most of these standards of most of the standards are, are on an international level level are coordinated uh, to use the same procedures, nomenclature and limits, they may also contain some deviations in language and some parameters that are appropriate in that region of the world. Now in addition to standard bodies that uh, promulgate these documents, revise them on differing time cycles, and they may not be exactly synchronized to implement changes at the same time that the overall international community uh, deems necessary. The 568C identifies two performance levels for field testers, accuracy levels 1 and 2. Accuracy level 2 is the toughest and is justified when you intend to operate your cable drops at or near the length of performance limits, including user cords and jumpers. The table behind me shows the minimum requirements for these two levels. Now, these accuracy levels are provided to ensure that the test equipment can actually measure the cable link parameters that need to be certified. Accuracy level 2 is intended to closely mimic the laboratory test equipment and turns out to be more than was needed for reasonable measurements. A third accuracy standard is now specified in 568C called Accuracy Level 2E. Now it allows for measurement of CAT5E. It is difficult to say which type of tester you need uh, for certification. The potential problems actually occur only at or near or very near the acceptable performance limits. 
in a cable plant that uses very high quality cable and components uh, and that has relatively short cable runs, you may never approach the limits required for your category of operation. However, if you use low quality materials and questionable installation practices, you may see a line of links at, at performance limits. Now the accuracy level 2 is difficult to achieve as its intent is to very closely emulate the performance of general purpose laboratory analyzers, costing 10 to 20 times as much. Now, now that the that TIA has endorsed level 2 E accuracy, uh, that is really all you need to properly verify link performance. Uh, for routine use, it may be sufficient to get an accuracy level 2 tester or one that does not achieve accuracy level 2 E on all parameters. Now, some testers may offer different performance levels of, on permanent links and channels because the channel test requires the use of the 8-pin modular connector at the test interface. Now, as a LAN manager, you may choose to get a less expensive uh, level 1 tester for your own casual troubleshooting use and then depend on the installation contractor for actual level 2 or E tests when are necessary. So testing costs. Proper testing costs money over and above the basic cost of installing and verifying the cable. As we will see in the, uh, coming up, there are many tools that may be used to test land wiring, and some of these tools are fairly simple testers that check continuity and wire map, and checking for your proper pin connections. Uh, the, use, the use of tools, such tools should uh, be considered a normal part of cable installation and included in the price. Now, these simple tests verify the DC electrical integrity of the link and find gross failures that would prevent the cable from functioning even if uh, in simple uses. Uh, this verification catches wiring errors and can find cases where the cable has been severely damaged after installation. Verification uh, by visual inspection and continuity check uh, once were considered sufficient testing telecommunications cables. Now this is no longer the case. The demanding cable performance that is required by modern LAN applications can no longer be met by such simple testing methods. To truly test a LAN wiring system to meet one of the more rigorous performance categories uh, requires the use of very sophisticated test equipment. Specialized field testers have been developed to reduce the cost of testing. Now these testers are far less expensive to purchase than the ultra-sophisticated laboratory RF network analyzers. These tests, uh, all sorts, this, these tests all sorts of electronic networks, not local uh, area computer networks. Yet, the field testers uh, yield useful results that closely match the measurement to the LAN category standards. They produce quick pass-fail indications and print full reports. These field testers are also very easy to use. They can run completely automated tests, store the results, and pinpoint problem locations for the cable under test. Now, most of these testers will operate for several hours on battery power, so you don't have to even have to find a power outlet. Although these testers provide many advantages, they also um, are still much more expensive than simple wiring verification tools, and they require additional skill to operate properly. Consequently, you should expect to pay extra for having your cable scanned with one of these field testers. The cost of the tester, the skilled operator time, and the preparation of the report, and the possible retesting should be considered when budgeting for the additional cable scanning step. You should allow a budgetary cost of 5 to 15 percent of the installation cost per drop to certify to permanent link standards. The cost variation is to allow for special circumstances such as and unusually difficult and expensive per drop cost. If the scanning is done by a separate contractor, you should allow an additional factor for problem determination or visual inspection. Scanning is best done before per, uh, personnel have moved into the office space. Now, although scanning involves only a brief visit to each workstation outlet, labor costs will be higher if furniture and people have to be moved. If your intention is to install a full CAT 5E or 6 wiring system, 
then you need to plan for a complete certification scan. The component standards and installation practices are simply too tough to not test completely for proper performance. If you have an existing facility that is supposed to meet CAD 5 and you have not previously tested it to 100 meg, then a new scan would be appropriate. To recertify CAT5 link for Gabriel Ethernet, you should test to the limits of the TSB95, as the full CAT5E limits should not be required. Uh, prior to the release of the of testing procedures and limits in TSB67, standard practice was to use CAT5 cable and components. Uh, install using the best current practices and test using whatever cable scanners are available at the time. Now the older 568 standards specifically excluded install cable and connectors from the scope. So let's look at the testing methods. To properly test installed cable and components, it is necessary to define the test structures such as the channel and the permanent link only by standardizing the testing equipment and detailing the, ex uh, the expected and necessary performance parameters. Uh, can we hope to determine whether the elements of the particular structured cabling system will meet the needs of the land wiring application? This section will describe all the test structures and individual elements that are tested for copper and fiber cabling. The channel and permanent link the installed cable link components of a horizontal link are measured either as a permanent link or as a channel. The difference between the two is that the channel includes actual equipment cords, the user cords, the patch cords, horizontal cross connect, and cross connect jumpers that will ultimately connect to the LAN equipment uh, at each end of the horizontal link. The permanent link excludes two, uh, two test equipment cords, one at each end, including the connectors at the tester end while the cords at the ends of the channel must be plugged directly into the test equipment interface with no allowance for test cords. The permanent link and channel shown here in, uh, behind me. Now as stated earlier, the reason for the two types of links is to facilitate testing at both the construction phase and the post installation phase. It is unusual for network hubs and workstations to be available during the construction phase of an installation. It will be time consuming and difficult to wait to detect and repair bad cable runs at some later time. Moreover, the cable installer may have little responsibility or influence of the, for the equipment cores. This two-step method of cable link specification allows the installed in the wall cable to be tested as soon as installation is complete. The complete link from network hub to workstation uh, can be further tested during, uh, during the installation of that equipment. So the equipment and testing requirements. The purpose of the standards in the TSB67 is twofold. The fun, or sorry, the full title of the TSB is Transmission Performance Specifications for Field Testing of Unshielded Twisted Pair Cabling Systems. That's a mouthful. Now, one explicit purpose, then, is to define cabling system performance after the cable's been installed. The other purpose, which is implied by uh, wanting to test in the field, is to determine field test performance. Early field testers did not always produce consistent results when compared to the ultra-expensive lab testing methods. So, the standard state, uh, states which tests will be done uh, what measure performance levels are important, and what tester accuracy and reporting is then required. The testing that is required includes parameter measurement for the following tests wire map, length attenuation, near and crosstalk loss. As more is learned about the requirements of networks operating at the higher levels, additional tests may be added to the field test specification and others may be modified. For example, uh, you'll notice that impedance and uh, structural realm loss uh, that are measured on uh, uninstalled cable uh, are missing from the specification for installed links. Now this is not because it's considered unimportant important, but because it's not yet known or agreed what levels are then appropriate. Now on the other hand, the cable length attenuation and the air crosstalk are currently tested. 
length of the cable run is important in influence and attenuation in the area of crosstalk values. But perhaps the ratio, the attenuation to crosstalk ratio, is a better indicator of overall system performance. Likewise, very high speed networks may care as, uh, as much about the propagation delay as the physical length of the cable. Yet the transmission delay is not yet specified nor, nor tested. Now, these new tests could be a boon to transmission engineers, but a bane to cable system designers and installers. Now, can you can just Im, uh, imagine telling your, your installer to keep cable runs under 300 nanoseconds? Uh, where do you get a tape measure uh, of that size? <laughs> um, let's, uh, let's look individually at each of the tests that are, are now required. Uh, wire map. The wire map test uh, checks for wiring errors and any significant cable faults such as shorts or opens. Uh, it's a good idea to check the real cable for shorts or opens before the installation uh, as uh, it'll be very hard to prove that the defect was not caused during the installation. You can also perform most of the other tests uh, as the real cable should easily pass uh, them before it has been installed. Now keep in mind that if you want to check near a crosstalk, you'll need to use a properly uh, rated connector uh, because its near a crosstalk will often be significant compared to that of the cable. The wire map test will check for continuity, short cross pairs, reverse pairs, uh, split pairs. Uh, the figure behind me shows the correct pinout pairing and, and most of the common wiring errors. Now, in the standard 5CC wiring scheme, the wires are paired 1 and 2, 3, 6, and 4, 5, and 7, 8. The pair numbering 1 through 4 varies slightly between A and B wiring patterns. Color codes for the cable are assigned on a pair basis. So, as uh, an example, pair 2 will always be orange and white, but may be assigned to pins 3 and 6 or to the 1, 2 pins depending on the wiring pattern. The tester has absolutely no idea what color are, um, the wires are. The technician will have to visually inspect them in the, in the design um, if the design requires that a particular pattern be used. However, if both ends of a cable or run are twisted with the same pattern, the field tester will pass the cable. If not, it will show a cross pair condition. Uh, as shown here behind me, and the field tester uh, also uh, easily finds split pairs, as shown here. Now, an impossible task for a DC continuity tester. Now, length. Length measurements are made on two types of cable lengths, the permanent link and the channel. Now, recall that these two links differ in that the channel includes the actual user equipment cables uh, that'll be attached to the hub and the workstation, uh, the workstation or whatever. Now, for the field tester, this means that the permanent link must include the test equipment cords at each end, but the channel must terminate directly into the tester or somehow exclude the effective tester cable from the measurement. The 560AC standard requires a horizontal link to be 90 meters or less with an allowance of an additional 10 meters for all user cords, jumpers, and patch cords. Now, because the horizontal link length cannot uh, directly be measured electrically by the field tester, which must somehow connect to the link under test, an allowance is made for two meter uh, test equipment cords. Now, this means that the permanent link is defined to have an acceptable length of 94 meters. Now the channel, which includes the user cords, uh, can be as much as 100 meters. From a practical standpoint, we would recommend that you use test cords that are exactly 2 meters in length. If you use a shorter cord, the tester may pass a link that exceeds the limit. If you use too long a cord, it may reject a link uh, that might actually be legal. Now, some testers require a test cord of at least 1 meter. Never fear, because of individual cable variations and the nominal velocity of propagation, the standard allows an additional 10% before it declares a length 
failure. Now, an interesting distinction should be pointed out in regard to length. The physical length of a channel or permanent link is an important parameter. Physical length may be measured or determined from markings on the cable. Cable testers uh, estimate electrical length from the propagation delay of the cable. Now, because propagation delay depends on the physical characteristics, such as twist pitch, and dielectric uh, properties of each pair, it varies with different categories of cables and even with different tools uh, that are being used uh, from the same manufacturer. Now, to accurately correct for manufacturing variations in cable, it is very important to measure the propagation delay of each reel of cable installed. The cable pair uh, with the sh shortest propagation delay would then be used. Now the procedure for calibrating length of field tester, length of a field tester, is to physically measure a length of cable from the reel to be installed and then calibrate the tester through an electrical length measurement on that same uh, sample of cable. The particular length of cable you use is not important, but it is important that its exact length be known. Now, however, accuracy of the calibration is increased with a longer piece of cable. A length of 15 meters, uh, or about 50 feet, or longer, is commonly recommended. Now, realistically, it would not be practical to cut and measure every rail of cable at a large job, but you should calibrate for each different cable, uh, cable lot. If possible, you might cut a length for one of uh, your cable runs to be uh, to use to calibrate the cable so uh, as to not waste uh, the sample. Now testers are required to have a length range of at least 310 meters, so that's about a thousand foot reel of cable could then be measured. However, until the cable uh, on a particular reel is calibrated, uh, this measurement should be considered only approximate. Stated lengths of reel cable are not exact and should not be um, used exclusively to uh, calibrate for, for the uh, for the NVP of a cable. Attenuation. Now the maximum attenuation for, for the purpose of testing the permanent link or channel uh, has been based on the attenuation values given in the standard 568C for horizontal cable, connecting hardware, and uh, jumper or patch cords. It prorates the loss values given in the, uh, dB per 100 meters and applies them to the worst case length of a link. Now the table here behind me shows a summary of the allowable attenuation values for the permanent link and the channel at selected frequencies. Now the TSB67 contains the formulas for calculating each of the components of permanent link or channel attenuation. The actual measurements should be made at intervals of 1 megahertz or less in the appropriate frequency band, but the tester will take care of this automatically. The attenuation test limit is a worst case length. The actual attenuation of a measured length will be less if the cable run is shorter than allowed. However, in most testers the measured loss is compared only to the limit of the worst case. This means that the test will not directly uh, catch cable that has greater than expected loss based on the installed cable limit for the plastic C. But the extra attenuation per meter should have no effect on link performance. If you wish to catch substandard cable, you'll have to compare the actual loss measurement with the expected loss for that particular length of cable. Now, as with the specification for uninstalled horizontal cable, there is an allowance for the effect of temperature on the attenuation of the cable. The allowance is 1.5% um, per degree of Celsius for CAT 3 and 0.4% for categories 4 and 5. Now to illustrate this, consider a cable installed in an attic where an actual temperature is 30 degrees Celsius rather than a normal 20 degrees Celsius of, of the standard. The attenuation link for a permanent link at 10 megahertz would be raised from 10 dB to 11.5 dB for CAT 5E. Now two other environmental factors are known to cause changes in attenuation, uh, metallic conduit and humidity. 
the difference expected for cable uh, in conduit is up to a 3% increase, but the standard allows no latitude in test limits. It should be expected that long runs in close proximity to other metal objects might also cause an increase in attenuation. You should keep this in mind in planning your design. The humidity effect is a new consideration. Now, some cable manufacturers have stated that the humidity effect is cumulative over time in PVC or plenum rated uh, PVC compound jacketed cable. And it may cause cable that originally tested good to fail after a period of exposure to high humidity. The standard makes no allowance for the effects of humidity. The cable link must pass the attenuation limits regardless of the humidity. This might be an argument against using the less expensive PVC insulation or plenum rated PVC compound jacket it might also be a warning signal for some of the uh, new uh, copolymers that contain other thermoplastics mixed with more expensive TFE compounds. Nearing crosstalk loss. Now the theory behind twisted pair wiring is that the twisting rotates the magnetic fields from the wire with the twist and coupling to nearby pairs or other objects is then minimized. However, some coupling does exist. Now, how much coupling occurs between pairs of wires on the same cable is of particular interest. Now, if too much signal is coupled from, say, the transmit pair to the receive pair of, of a connection, the receiver will not be able to distinguish the far end signal from its own transmissions. Now, this coupling is illustrated here behind me. Now, the coupling between the pairs of cable is called crosstalk. Now, because the crosstalk between transmit and receive pairs is greatest when the transmitted signal is unaffected by attenuation, the worst case occurs at the same end of the cable where a test signal is transmitted. Now, this is called near end and yields the expression uh, near end crosstalk or NEXT. Now, the near end crosstalk is measured in dB below the test signal. Technically, near and crosstalk would be a negative uh, dB number, but we turn it around by calling it near and crosstalk loss. Now, this means that a large near and crosstalk number in dB, um, indicating much less isolation from pair to pair, uh, near and crosstalk must be measured in both directions on the cable uh, to prevent the situation where one end of a cable passes near and crosstalk and the other end fails. Uh, Single-ended measurements are often made in uh, the telecommunications room as it eliminates carrying the tester around each workstation outlet. Excessive untwist at the connector is uh, more often found at the workstation end. However, because the outlets naturally separate the conductors and because the individual jack plates are more difficult to inspect, also the workmanship may be less because uh, because the supervisory control may not be as great as would exist in the telecommunications room. So, if you only measure at one end, you're likely to miss uh, more of the high near and crosstalk connections. The equipment at both ends requires appro appropriately low near and crosstalk to operate properly. Now, a related a figure of merit for a cable link is the ACR. Um, now, although not yet specified by the standards, ACR is a very good measure of how the attenuation in the air and crosstalk can influence the performance of networking, of networking interface devices. Attenuation may be used to calculate the received signal strength of a uh, signal transmitted uh, from the far end. Now, near and crosstalk can yield the level of the interfering crosstalk signal from the near end transmitter. The near end receiver is thus required to cope with a signal to noise ratio that is basically the ratio of the two signals. The attenuated far end transmission and near end crosstalk. Now, since both attenuation and near end crosstalk are directly measured uh, as part of the testing, it's very it's a very simple um, to ratio the two uh, to produce the ACR figure. Now, the higher the ACR number, 
the better the expected performance since a ratio of two logarithmic quantities is their numerical difference. The ratio is simply ACR equals attenuation in dB times near and crosstalk in dB. One of the things that concerns network hardware designers is that ACR decreases steadily with frequency. Now this means that at 100 megahertz the ACR margin may be very small. Thus it may be a benefit to those planning to eventually go beyond 100 megahertz to purchase cable with the highest ACR possible. Now, reporting the pass and fail criteria. An important part of the TSP67 is the carefully detailed requirements for the reporting of the test results. In general, the standard requires that each measured result be re uh, reported in units appropriate for the test and that a pass or fail determination be reported. Measurements uh, such as the attenuation from the air and crosstalk that might be very close to the limits are reported with an asterisk in addition to the pass or fail. A data report is simply the visual indication of the field test set. In all the modern cable scanners, the visual display is a liquid crystal display that uh, also allows the display of some graphics. Now, of course, it is important for a permanent record of the report to be made, so the testers allow um, the test data for each cable to be stored and then later printed out. Figure uh, behind me shows a typical cable scanning report. Now, the wire map tests are reported simply as pass or fail. The length measurement is performed on all pairs of the cable under the test, but the pair with the shortest electric, electrical delay is used for the pass fail determination. And its electrical length uh, in feet or meters is then reported. An additional 10% length is permitted to allow for the uncertainty of, in the NVP of the cable. A tester must uh, make a determination of attenuation, pass fail, based on calculation of the allowable attenuation at each frequency of the measurement. If the cable fails, the attenuation of the frequency or the highest frequency or failure is then reported. Measurement steps are to be no greater than 1 MHz. Uh, intervals up to 100 megahertz for CAT 5e or the maximum frequency for lower categories of cable. Attenuation values of uh, less than 3 dB are reported but are not used in the pass fail determination. An optional determination of the attenuation per unit of length is calculated for cables longer than 15 meters and identified if they are greater than expected. However, higher than expected attenuation per unit uh, length values do not cause a failure to report it, but might be a cause for concern. The near and crosstalk loss is made in steps of 150 kilohertz from 1 to 31.25 megahertz and 250 kilohertz to 31.25 uh, to 100 megahertz. For the next test, the measurement of the worst pair combination is used. The tester may report that the actual next or near and crosstalk or the near and crosstalk margin, although near and crosstalk margin is required for failure reports or when the measurement is within the tester's accuracy for the limits. Uh, near and crosstalk margin is a value of most significance to cable installers because it indicates when marginal insulation practices may be corrected uh, by retermination or rerouting. Often, the near and crosstalk can be reduced by maintaining the twist of the pair as close to the point of termination as possible. Test reports that must indicate whether the cable under test has passed or failed each requirement. Now, because of the difficulty in establishing an absolute measurement near the performance, uh, limits of the cable length. Now, a cable may be falsely accused or failure or, or improperly passed. The standard takes a clever way of dealing with this problem, essentially including the tester's accuracy as if it were part of the cable under test and allowing for an additional 10% of cable length. Uh, a fail indication thus is a sure indication that of a parameter that is outside the limit. A fail indicates that the tester measured a value that is outside the test limit but by an amount within the tester's accuracy.
a pass indication is assumed to be adequately below the limit with the accuracy of the instrument taken into consideration. However, a pass indication that results from a test measurement that is within the accuracy level of the actual limit is marked with an asterisk or a pass. Now this link, or the link, is still considered to pass the test, but is a handy visual clue to which links may be at or near the absolute limits. A prudent installer might want to take a second look at this link, or take a second look at your tester and recalibrate. Uh, because the test reporting procedures allow an additional length variation of 10% in measurement uh, of the electrical length to account for MVT, NVP variations, you should really respect the length uh, limit of the tester. Now, occasionally, the source of a fail indication will be the short link problem, which we talked about earlier. Certain links uh, under about 15 meters may exhibit near and crosstalk failure due to the resonance phenomenon. Now, these links may actually be cured by replacing the run with a longer length of cable. The test equipment. The proper use of test equipment is one of the most important aspects of a successful land wiring installation. Test equipment may be subdivided into two types. Basic troubleshooting equipment, diagnostic measurement, Equipment. Basic troubleshooting equipment consists of devices that check continuity, the DC resistance and simple wire maps. Diagnostic measurement equipment is used to measure cable parameters, determine compliance with standards, and diagnose specific cable problems. So which type of equipment should you have? Well, you have to an the answer to that question depends on the type of work that you need to do. If you do any amount of cable installation and troubleshooting, you need most of the basic test equipment that we described. If you uh, need to test or certify cable to cabling standards, you'll need a field tester capable of meeting accuracy requirements or the category that you're testing. Fiber optic cable requires special test equipment, uh, even for routine, routine tests such as fiber optic in installation. You should have fiber optic attenuation measurement equipment at the least. And you may need more sophisticated scanning equipment to locate fiber faults. How much money should you spend for test equipment um, if you're the network manager? Well, a good rule of thumb is to expect to spend about 2% to 5% of the value of your networking equipment, including your workstations and servers, for test analysis and your monitoring equipment. As an alternative, you could allow 10% of the value of just the cable, hubs, and bridges for test equipment. The point is that you need to have a reasonable capability to test and troubleshoot your network. Without the proper equipment, you are flying blind. You'll suffer from periodic cases of um, equipment us, uh, substitutus, <laughs> um, which means you'll be substituting equipment here and there, running around, carrying computers, moving in switches here and there. Um, that was like a pig Latin there for um, substituting equipment. The equipment does substitute us. Um, to avoid this uh, syndrome, simply obtain the necessary test equipment to simplify and speed your troubleshooting. You also need a certain amount of test and monitor equipment to verify the health of your network and to spot trends that may have a negative effect on performance in the future. The rest of this chapter will be devoted to the essential test equipment that you need and the methods to, uh, to use in employing the more sophisticated testers. In addition to the physical layer equipment that we show, you may also need to have uh, LAN protocol analyzers that deal with the higher layers of networking. These tools uh, will help you answer the age-old question, okay, if it's not the cable, then what is it? Well, First tester we want to look at is a continuity tester or voltmeter. Uh, the basic item of the test equipment that should be in your toolbox is a good electronic voltmeter. The voltmeter should be able to read DC volts, AC volts, and ohms. Uh, it should be durable and have an easy to read display. A hold function is also nice. It allows you to make a measurement and later read that display. This is great for those times when you're deep inside a punch down block or in an area with very low lighting. Many voltmeters have a continuity function 
uh, with an audible beep, such as uh, some, some of us consider this a mandatory requirement, not me, uh, not a big fan of it actually. Uh, voltmeters can make uh, quite a few basic tests. For example, you can check continuity and DC resistance uh, on a new reel of cable. Uh, if you know the uh, resistance of a, of a full reel, you can easily even estimate the remaining length from the DC resistance value. The, with test adapters, you can check continuity on jack, patch panel, or patch cord. Uh, you can make a few simple uh, adapters, uh, wraparound plugs, and breakout plugs to help you use the meter for continuity and voltage measurement. You can also check for potential dangerous voltages that may exist on cable runs between telecommunications rooms or between buildings. A type of bond uh, voltmeter that is particularly handy in the field is the probe style digital voltmeter. Uh, this one, now like the one shown behind me here, it has got the entire meter circuitry and display in one oversized probe. Now the other probe is connected via a short wire to the probe meter, which is a type of voltmeter. Um, yeah, do not have to find out flat surface for the meter. It's um, it's because it's just right in your hand. Uh, the beeper and LED continuity testers are also available and may be effectively used to test wires and connections. Continuity testing merely verifies that an electrical contact uh, has been made and does not really measure you know, how good that contact is. It just measures that the two are actually there. However, it is rare in these systems to get an, uh, an ohms contact, one that has a significant resistance to it. Uh, because IDC connectors are used almost exclusively these days in LAN wiring, the metallic wire is then scraped clean out of the uh, clean of contaminants during the termination process, and the actual point of contact remains virtually what we call gas-free, eliminating any oxidation of the contacting surfaces that would lead to increased resistance. Dusty and corrosive environments are an exception to this rule. Uh, if we look at cable wire map testers, a very good device to test and install cable link is the wire map tester. Now, these little testers give an indication of cable continuity and proper pinout. They are generally used for installed cables or assembled cable, assembled cords. Now, one type of main tester and a remote unit, um, uh, the two units communicate across the cable to perform a wire map test. Uh, which is very essentially, it's just a continuity test. Now most of these testers can easily find all the standard connection, uh, connection errors and, uh, and problems, such as any opens, uh, shorts, reversed wires, uh, and cross connections. Now these cable faults uh, we'll, we're going to talk about next, and simple miswirings are probably the most common cable installation problems and the easiest to fix. The simple wire uh, map test performs a simple DC continuity test, checks for undesired connections, and it does not check for proper pairing, as with a split pair fault. A split pair is a condition where one of the two wires in one pair is accidentally exchanged for wires in another pair. For example, white-green and the white-brown might just become exchanged. Now, this actually means that two pairs are, are now mixed and the balance and self-shielding properties of the pair uh, will be lost. In this type of miswire, DC connectivity tests fine uh, and it would pass a simple wire map test, but the cable would fail if tested for AC signal uh, balance by a cable scanner. In many instances, a cable with a split pair fault will cause a LAN link to fail which is why it's important to test for this with the uh, more sophisticated scanners. The specialized version of the wire map tester is used to test assembled cables. This uh, cable continuity tester has two modular jacks where each end of the cable is plugged in. When the button of the tester is pressed, LED is light to indicate continuity of each wire in the test cable. One by one, a pass is indicated by observing that the LEDs uh, each light up in order through the number of pins in the cable. This type of tester may be used for 6-pin modular connectors in addition to 8-pin connectors and LAN wiring. Frequently, 
the same test jack is used for both sizes of connectors. This creates a potential false failure problem for pins 1 and 8 on the 8 pin plug. Although the 6 wire plug will fit into the jack of the tester, the plastic sides of the plug may uh, permanently bend the jack's first and eighth pins, making them no longer contact pins 1 through 8 on the 8 position plug, and then giving us a false indication of failure. The solution is to never use 6 pin plugs in a tester that you intend to use for 8 pin plugs. If you believe a false failure has occurred, you can usually form a small stiff uh, uh, stiff wiring paper clip to bend the jack wires back into the position. Then test cable again. Cable tracers. How do you find a single cable in a bundle of cables? Well, how can you quickly verify that an outlet is properly marked? The answer is to use a high impedance tone generator and an inductive cable tester as shown behind me. Now these are two of the handiest tools around and no serious cable installer should be without them. The tone generator was originally developed by the telephone industry to assist its installers in tracing wires into and out of the distribution frame. Any unmarked jack would quickly be traced by placing a tone on the jack and using the telephone test set, commonly called uh, a butt inset or just the butt set, to find a tone. The tone's distinct warbling sound could be uh, easily distinguished from other sounds on the telecommunications wire. However, the butt in set had to be physically connected to one of the cable ends to hear the tone. Something else was needed. That something was called an inductive pickup. Now this device uses a coil and a probe point to, make, to magnetically couple to a cable so that you can pick up the, the uh, tone without having to make electrical contact with any of the wires. Now there's two types of inductive cable tracers, passive pickup and amplified pickup. The passive pickup contains only a pickup coil, often called a banana probe, because of its shape. Now, this tracer requires the use of a butt inset to hear the tone. The amplified probe contains a battery-powered amplifier in addition to the pickup coil. Now, a momentary contact switch conserves battery power when the pickup is not in use. The amplified probe can be uh, the amplified probe can be uh, uh, quite sensitive as long as the area is allegedly noise free. However, uh, certain cable areas may generate much electrical noise for the amplified probe to function effectively. This is particularly true of live telephone circuits where the residual tone will be faint at best. Many installers carry both types of probes to the job. Cable scanners. The advent of structured wiring standards has increased the need for very sophisticated portable field test sets that thoroughly test the cable run. Now, these test sets are often called cable scanners because they use time domain reflect reflectometry or TDR techniques to scan along the cable's length for anomalies. Reflectometry is somewhat akin to a radar for cable. A pulse is sent along cable pair and then the cable pair is monitored to see what comes back and precisely when it does. The type of reflection that returns is related to whether there is a short and open or a termination or a deformity along the cable. Of course, the cable may have several conditions that, refl that, that reflect part of the pulse. The length of time that it takes for a pulse reflection to return is directly related to the distance from the test set. The 560 standard specifies the types of tests that must be made, the way in which the reporting must be done, and the accuracy levels of these field test sets. Accuracy levels, reporting requirements, and testing methods are explained uh, earlier. Uh, many cable scanners have an additional LAN traffic function that is very useful to the LAN manager. This function allows the passive monitoring of a LAN connection to measure traffic and gather some basic LAN statistics. Most of these testers, for example, can determine LAN utilization, which would be expressed as a percentage. Now, some also measure other LAN traffic parameters and show potential error conditions such as collisions, now, even though this goes beyond the cable testing certifications for a generic cable system, it can be a very useful feature to monitor the basic network functions. 
So let's look at the analog versus digital field testers. The difference exists between the two measurement technologies for high performance cable scanners. The two techniques are generally called analog and digital. The analog testers use a conventional continuous waveform to test such link parameters as attenuation and near and crosstalk. The frequency of the waveform is changed or stepped or swept and the measurement repeated at each hundredth of the discrete of frequency steps uh, that are required for a full bandwidth testing. Now the digital testers measure these parameters by generating a series of pulses then using digital signal processing techniques to derive the same parameters at all step frequencies more or less simultaneously. The testing requirements of the 5CHC have been drawn from the TSB67. Now, they push the performance limits of field tester technology. The TSB defines strict accuracy levels for the testers and defines two test configurations for testing a horizontal cabling link, the permanent link, and the channel. Now, in the bulletin, swept slash step techniques are used to illustrate the measurements required of field testing for cable links. However, the TSB allowed other methods using frequency domain or time domain digital pulse DSP measurements uh, that are equivalent to the swept frequency or analog methods. In addition, the 67 uh, followed the interesting practice of excluding the actual connection. For example, the plug-in jack that attaches to the tester to the link under the test. In the case of the permanent link, this connector is not specified as it is, the, it is at the tester end at the um, two, 2 meter maximum test cable. Some tester manu manufacturers use a higher performance low near and cross dock connector at the tester so as to not introduce ad adverse levels of near and cross dock into the link that's under test. However, at the channel interface, the actual user cable must connect to the tester at each end. The user cable must be terminated in the standard 8-pin modular plug, which unfortunately has relatively poor near and cross off performance. The most intriguing claim of the digital tester advocates, uh, advocates is, to, uh, is that the pulse the, uh, DSP technique um, allows them to totally exclude the contribution to near and crosstalk and other parameters that result from the uh, modular connector uh, at the uh, tester itself. The modular connector is the required test interface for channel measurement. So an alternative uh, low near and crosstalk connector cannot be used as it could as it could for the permanent link. Now remember that a very significant portion of the detrimental crosstalk occurs at this modular connector interface. Digital signal processing can actually exclude this connection measurement unlike conventional analog methods. So which type of field tester are you going to use? Uh, sorry, we're going to have to leave that um, up to you because it's really going to come down to so many different variables and one of them is going to be money. The technical positions of each tester or manufacturer are strong and emotions run high there, are base, there, there has basically been an agreement to disagree on which is going to be the best tester. You may wish to look at several different models and then make your own judgment. Frankly, the, the many testers on the market actually differ in features, options, reporting, format, price, and measurement speed in addition to the measurement technique. Either style of tester is acceptable, both to the TIA working committees and to the qualified independent evaluators. The bottom line? Choose the specific tester that will do the best job for you. Period. TDRs and optical TDRs. Although cable scanners uh, use a form of TDR to perform the most uh, important certification measurement, a traditional TDR may provide additional insights into cable operation. Expensive laboratory TDRs may not uh, be needed, as some of the field testers mentioned in the previous section now incorporate TDR graphics in their instruments. The actual graph of a, of a cable's reflections can reveal many things about the handling and installation of the LAN wiring that simple pass-fail reports and raw measurements obscure. The traditional TDR screen shown here behind me uh, 
Optical fiber has a more sophisticated testing requirement than does metallic cabling, and the uh, same low loss characteristics that make fiber optics important in transmitting longer distances make loss measurements critical to ensuring fiber optical performance. Optical cable is also subject to impairments from bending and stress that cause additional signal loss. It is often more expensive to replace an entire run of fiber than to simply find the location of the fault and repair it by splicing the cable, particularly if outside the plant cable, um, the uh, plant cable is involved. Uh, the problem is how to find the fault. Well, an optical a version of the TDR called the Optical Time Domain Reflector uh, is a solution. Now, this device operates in the same manner as the conventional TDR, but uses a pulse of light rather than an electrical pulse. Modern uh, OTDRs display a graphic that shows the signal return of the fiber along its length. Now, by moving a cursor, uh, you can pinpoint a distance from the source to an anomaly. Now, then the area of the fault can be located by direct measurement. If the fault is obvious from the outside of the cable, the bad fiber may simply be cut and spliced via fusion or a coupling. Otherwise, it may be necessary to replace a section of cable, similarly spliced. Uh, the OTDRs may provide built-in connections for both single mode and multi-mode fiber because the uh, 5CHC standard recognizes both fiber types both will need to be tested in large systems. The standard allows several types of fiber optic connectors, including the new uh, small form factor types, as well as traditional types, such as the SD and the uh, 568SC, for use with both fiber types. Single mode fiber requires a special laser type source to couple light effectively into the fiber. Because of the uh, measurement uh, involves optical loss, it is essential that the coupling be the proper type of source. Adaptation to different styles of fiber optic connectors may be required. The basic fiber optic testers. Optical fiber may be effectively tested with simpler equipment. Uh, very basic uh, fiber test equipment couples light into one end of a fiber link and then detects it at the other end. Now, some of these testers use visible light, so you can theoretically see the light at the end of the tunnel. However, some higher power links may have enough infrared light output that it could be dangerous to the eye. Now, because the infrared light is invisible, you should never look directly into a fiber from any close distance. A good practice with one of these testers is to use a detector or to observe the light, uh, if visible, on another source, such as a sheet of paper. The optical loss measurement may also be used to test optical fiber. Now, this equipment measures simple optical loss over a fiber link by placing a calibrated light source at one end of the cable and a sensitive optical power meter at the other end. Well, now that's it for chapter 15. If you need, if needed, you can move on to any of the online assessments that may have been posted for you, and then come on back here for chapter 16. I promise you it's going to be a lot smaller. Uh, chapter 16 will be monitor and ministering your land wiring. See you.